My, my name is Rasim Jagaluk. I teach at the Russian and Slavic Studies Department at NYU. And I very much like to welcome you to this very important event on post-invasion Russia, hosted by the Jordan Center. Uh, in it, we'll be asking questions of whether, for example, uh, the sanctions are crippling Russia's economy or whether military Keynesianism is working, whether the massive patriotic and educational campaigns are having the desired effect or whether the population is becoming further atomized, whether the state's uh, attempts to reorder the, the political system uh, are uh, producing a, a retrenching the regime's power or conversely, destabilizing it and producing um, crises of which the Prigozhin's which was, was only the first. And, you know, please forgive me if I wear this very smug smile for the rest of the presentation, but I'm really incredibly pleased with myself that I can bring uh, the social scientists who, who better than uh, really anyone are able to answer these questions. Um, and uh, so, uh, so I, I will now, without further ado, ado go on to present them. Uh, starting with Vavodi uh, Ishinka, uh, who is a research associate at the Institute of European Studies at the Freie University in Berlin. His research focuses on protests and social movements, on revolutions and radicalization, right and left politics, nationalism and civil society. He published widely on contemporary Ukrainian politics, the Euro Maidan Revolution and the ensuing war. He has been a prominent contributor to The Guardian, Al Jazeera, New Left Review, and Jacobin. He is currently uh, finishing a collective monograph, The Maidan Uprising, Mobilization, Radicalization, uh, and Revolution in Ukraine, 2013 to 2014. To, to his right, but not politically, is, is uh, Alek Juravlyov. Uh, a sociologist working on social movements, the sociology of knowledge, Marxism, uh, and pragmatic sociology. Alec is a research fellow at the Scholar Normale Superiore in Italy, and is a member of the Public Sociology Lab in Russia. He received his PhD in social sciences from the European University Institute, and his writings have been published in post-Soviet affairs, the International Journal of Politics, Culture, and Society, uh, studies of East European thoughts and many others. Um, and I first got to know Alek in his capacity as uh, one of the founding members of the Arkady Cos Band, which I warmly recommend to, to all of you. Uh, then further to his right uh, is Silya Matveev, uh, a researcher focusing on Russian and com comparative political economy and currently a visiting scholar at Berkeley. His uh, writings have appeared in academic journals such as South Atlantic Waterley or the Journal of Labor and Society, among many others, as well as in public outlets such as Jacobin, Open Democracy, and, and others. Uh, like Alec, he's a member of the Public Sociology Lab, a group of Russian social scientists studying post-Soviet societies from a critical perspective as well as an affiliate of the Alameda Institute, a new research network of left-wing in intellectuals. And helping uh, uh, us keep, uh, keep everything in control uh, is, uh, will be uh, Katia Aziashvili, uh, who, who is the managing editor of Comparative Politics and who teaches politics at Sarah Lawrence University. Her research, uh, and, she, and, and teaching interests includes ethnic conflict, political economy, revolutions and social movements, politics of Eastern Europe and post-Soviet states, American constitutional law and American political development. And so with this, I receive into the shadows and pass all of you the, the baton. So, so I think uh, the way that we're going to do this is uh, our speakers are going to give a presentation about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll leave time for questions. Um, Ilya, are you yep. the first one to start? Yep, thank you. Thank you. 
I'm also smiling like Rosan because I'm really happy to be here and uh, very grateful uh, to Rosan and to Jordan Center for inviting us. Uh, although the topic, of course, is quite great, what we're going to discuss uh, today. Uh, so I will begin with this. Uh, when uh, the invasion of Ukraine uh, happened, it was uh, such a shock that many people, myself included, made rather dramatic predictions. Uh, and usually they concerned the possible economic collapse in Russia or even the collapse of the political regime. Uh, but uh, these predictions failed to materialize. So Russian economy did not collapse. Russian political regime is uh, still standing. And despite this fact, uh, in, in some conferences and some seminars here in the United States, um, I see this tendency to kind of reject this idea a little bit. And some people still feel that you know, collapse is around the corner and uh, this is all some kind of temporary illusion that uh, the situation is in Russia is stable. And probably, in fact, the problems are very deep, but we just don't see them. And then people begin to speculate about these problems. So what are they, right? And I think that we need to sort of recognize that maybe uh, we were wrong uh, in the first weeks of the invasion. And maybe there's not going to be a collapse, right? So maybe uh, what happens now in Russia is the emergence of a new and stable thing, which is quite scary. So this kind of political economic order that we see emerging in the country, but uh, there is absolutely no guarantee that uh, this order will be short-lived. So maybe this is, uh, uh, we're here for the long haul. Uh, so may I have the first slide, please? Uh, so consider the economic uh, situation. Uh, when the war began, all the international financial institutions predicted that uh, Russian GDP would fall by at least 15%, which is actually quite unprecedented in uh, peacetime. Uh, so when the country is not attacked itself, you know. Uh, but the sanctions against Russia were also unprecedented. And there were these predictions that Russian economy would not be able to uh, kind of sustain its activities in this new environment. And I also thought that uh, Russian economy would maybe not collapse, but there would be a, a huge fall in the G GDP because uh, Russia is very globalized. It is very integrated into the global economy and sanctions would create kind of a logistical nightmare, uh, a financial uh, upheaval, and all this will lead to um, a huge uh, upheaval in the, in the economy itself. But then all these organizations such as the IMF had to revise their predictions throughout 2022. Uh, so they said first 15%, then 11%, then 8%, then 5%. And then the final figure published by uh, Rostat, Russia's statistical agency was just 2% uh, fall in the GDP. Uh, that there are reasons not to believe Russian authorities and Russian official statistics and uh, some experts in the US even made the name of themselves just doubting kind of for information coming from Russia. But in fact, uh, there are external data to corroborate this. For instance, trade volumes with uh, different countries. So you can uh, look at the trade statistics and see that uh, trade kind of uh, returned to normal, returned to pre-war levels, trade with Russia in terms of volumes of oil and gas and coal, you know, the destinations changed, but the trade volumes returned to pre-war levels. Uh, then you have uh, the monitoring of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions that indirectly points out to industrial activity. And uh, by monitoring emissions, you see that uh, there was a modest decline in 2022, but then uh, Russian industry apparently returned to pre-war levels. And so uh, the air pollution also returned to pre-war levels, which means that uh, economic activity in general returned to pre-war levels. So uh, there really was no huge decline in Russia. 
And uh, the thing about the Russian economy is that uh, on the one hand, it's quite resilient. On the other hand, there is really not much uh, to show for. So ordinary Russians are very poor. I mean, uh, when, uh, when we look at uh, today's economic figures, we kind of tend to forget about this, that we know that Russia is so successful in battling sanctions and so on. But in reality, Russians are very poor. So uh, the median salary is about $400 in current exchange rate. Uh, like <laughs> parts of the population, according to the surveys, cannot afford anything uh, except uh, food and clothes. So no consumer durables, any kind of consu consumer durable, there's a struggle to obtain it. Uh, families spend on average 40% of their disposable income on food, which is very high uh, in comparative terms. So Russians are poor and they are struggling. Uh, and of course, there was zero income growth in 10 years. So Russian, not only was the Russian economy stagnating, but also the incomes, uh, if we look at uh, the 10 year perspective, did not grow at all, which is actually a fantastically bad result. It's not like Russian incomes were very high to begin with, but then they just didn't grow for 10 years. And of course, the gap between Russia and even other developing countries such as China only grows each year because of that. But at the same time, we see that this kind of economic organization uh, sort of does its job. And the job is to sustain uh, the Kremlin's uh, aggressive foreign policy, to sustain regime survival, and to sustain this aggressive foreign policy. So on the one hand, uh, living standards are very low. On the other hand, uh, recently, New York Times published a story that apparently, according to intelligence sources, uh, missile production in Russia exceeded pre-war levels. So Russia now produces more precision uh, guided munitions than before the war, which kind of indicates the failure of sanctions, unfortunately, because the point was to weaken the military industrial complex through this uh, logistical um, different logistical measures, uh, export bans, and so on. But despite all this, uh, missile production is more than pre-war level. And uh, other types of munitions, sometimes it's uh, kind of a magnitude more than before the war. So Russian military industrial complex is really just expanding. And this indicates that uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the economy, there's just uh, no collapse. And uh, on the contrary, uh, the economy is increasingly militarized. And as we shall see later, this might even indicate a kind of stable new economic situation that Russian economy would be militarized for a long time and uh, would be able to exist on the basis of this expanded military production for quite a long time. So this is the economic situation. Then the political system. Again, when the war began, uh, kind of my impression was that the shock wave would be so strong among the elites that there's going to be some uh, political upheaval as well. I mean, to be honest, I didn't expect that there's, there's going to be some kind of mass movement that would be able to stop the war or overthrow uh, the authorities. But uh, I thought that even for Russian elites, this is just uh, such a shock in itself that there's going to be political struggle at the top and there's going to be instability. Uh, instead, we see <laughs> a, a relative calm. Overall, we see relative calm. So the political situation is a bit similar to the economic situation. So Russian political system is uh, suboptimal in the sense that it is very corrupt, very inefficient. There is constant waste and uh, furthermore, we see uh, the spectacle of Prigozhin's mutiny, which is which was a huge embarrassment because in reality uh, there was no real response from the Kremlin. It's so weird that uh, there was literally an armed uprising in the country, but no one was punished for it except Prigozhin, and that was done in kind of covert way. You know that we didn't do this. Somehow he just died on his plane, on his own. So you can't even call this uh, punishment. And uh, the, the people who participated in his mutiny, they were not punished. 
And apparently, uh, this just demonstrated that in Russia, you can stage an armed uprising and then nothing is going to happen to you. So this was a huge embarrassment, uh, in my opinion, for Putin personally. But again, we see that, yes, it was an embarrassment. Yes, it doesn't look good, but the political system does its job. So it's not optimal, but it is working. It is working for the twin goals of uh, regime survival and also uh, it is able to continue waging this war. And in fact, uh, uh, before the war, political scientists uh, had kind of a consensus that uh, the main purpose of uh, the political system in Russia is uh, just to reproduce itself, right? To reproduce this political regime. But waging this war, it's such a massive affair that it's a different thing. It's different from regime survival. And so Russian political system was able to adapt and uh, to, to have two goals at once, to reproduce itself, to maintain this political regime, to maintain the regime of Putin's personal power, and also to continue waging the war, which means uh, mobilizing all resources towards this purpose and making unpopular, uh, extremely unpopular me measures <laughs> such as mass conscription, Obviously, it was highly unpopular, but still, even after waiting for several months, still the Kremlin decided to do this. And in fact, uh, this might happen again. So mobilization would totally happen again. Uh, I can't say in what specific conditions this decision will be made, that we need another wave of conscription. But I think that it, it, is, it is possible. And the regime will survive this, even though... Uh, th there is kind of frustration in particular with uh, conscription and with sending people to the front. So, uh, so yeah, just like the economic system, the political system does its job. This is the conclusion. Uh, but there is an even scarier possibility. So it's not just improvisation. It's not just ad hoc measures to maintain the system but maybe something new and stable is emerging in Russia. So first of all, uh, the militarization of the economy creates its own beneficiaries. And uh, Valodia will probably talk about this in more detail if he decides to do so. Uh, so uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, served at the front at some point as soldiers. So they received this uh, benefits from the Russian state as soldiers. Uh, tens of like dozens of thousands of soldiers died and their families received uh, this money from the government uh, connected to the death of a soldier at the front. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people, probably millions of people in total are working in the military industrial complex. And uh, all of these factories work uh, seven days a week, uh, 24 hours a day. So they work around the clock. There are three shifts at all the military factories in Russia at the moment. And so they hire new workers. And so dozens of thousands of people find employ employment in the military industrial complex. And so we see millions of people directly benefiting from the war economy. And this changes the social outlook in the country because it creates a whole social group of people who benefit from the war. And this points out that the situation just might be very stable because now we have uh, a constituency in society materially benefiting uh, from the war. Uh, we also see basically full criminalization of dissent. And uh, it's not just an authoritarian regime, it's a regime that is in a state of emergency, basically, where even the smallest expressions of dissent, opposition are just criminalized and people are immediately uh, sent to prison. And because of digitalization, uh, the state is very advanced in its repression methods, in its persecution methods. So rule through fear and very rigid uh, ideology, indoctrination through the school system. So probably a lot of people heard that uh, there's a new history textbook in Russia. And when you compare different passages from the new textbook and from the old textbook, you feel like you are in Orwell's novel because this is literally erasure of the past. So the old textbook says what actually happened and the new textbook says uh, some Stalinist fantasy about Stalin's period, for instance. So 
this is very scary to think what will happen uh, after a generation of kids will grow up, uh, you know, studying with these textbooks. So what kind of society will we have in Russia? And I think that all of these things together point out to the possibility that uh, what we have now in Russia is a stable new political order that is basically fascist in nature, uh, in a sense that is just comparable to the regime in Nazi Germany in its constituent parts, right? So a private economy, which is nevertheless uh, mobilized by the state, uh, ideological monopoly, uh, kind of mobilization of the masses, uh, nationalist ideology, indoctrination through the education system, all these points out that this can be for the long haul. So this thing can, can last uh, a long time. So I don't want to move in the opposite direction too much that first I predicted, you know, like upheaval and collapse. Now I predict stability. But uh, at the moment, unfortunately, I don't really see any real contradictions and signs of tension in the Russian society that might indicate that uh, some changes are around the corner. I just don't see and I don't recognize these kinds of tension. So... Uh, the conclusion is that uh, this new order that emerges in Russia might be quite stable. Yeah, and uh, the ability of uh, this new order of this emerging system depends on uh, popular support, of course. And uh, when the war uh, started, uh, we could immediately uh, see the first results of uh, mass opinion polls which showed that uh, the total majority of ordinary Russians uh, supported the so-called special military operation. And our laboratory, uh, public sociology laboratory, uh, uh, our social science team, uh, decided to uh, understand what uh, does it mean for people who to, 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 to be a supporter of, of the war. Um, because um, even if a person declares, look, I support the special military operation, no one knows exactly what does it mean for her. And uh, so from the very beginning of the war, uh, we, uh, we are conducting uh, uh, empirical sociological research uh, to, uh, uh, to study popular support for uh, the so-called special military operation. And uh, uh, many people claimed, especially uh, in the web, uh, that um, um, ordinary Russians uh, share um, um, imperialistic uh, uh, views with the Russian elite. Uh, the opposite uh, suggestion the opposite uh, sorry the opposite um, opinion was like that russian people don't care uh, so they uh, are atomized auto atomized and and uh, 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 live their personal life and and just don't care about the world so uh, what we did we conducted uh, about 200 in-depth interviews with ordinary russians uh, both reporters and opponents uh, over the world in spring 2022, then we conducted 100 interviews in autumn uh, 2022. Um, and partly we um, took interviews with the same people uh, we interviewed uh, in spring uh, to check what, what, what changed with, with uh, uh, um, how, how their uh, attitudes changed. Uh, and then we uh, mm, mm, also, mm, mm, we just finished uh, uh, focus groups. We conducted in uh, four cities, uh, eight focus groups. Um, we, we conducted it uh, together with, in collaboration with the Chroniki team. Chroniki team is a, a great team which, which uh, conducts uh, opinion polls. And so we have, knowledge about dynamics of popular moods, popular support for the uh, for the war against Ukraine. 
So uh, what we uh, revealed in the very beginning, in, in spring, uh, was that uh, support for the war uh, was quite stable and quite widespread. Uh, but what was interesting is that uh, people uh, supported the special military operation, not because they shared some common militaristic or imperialistic views with those in power with the Kremlin, but quite the opposite. What people, um, very different and very many people, uh, told us in the interviews was like, we don't know uh, those in power, uh, people from Kremlin, and we, to be honest, even don't like them, but uh, precisely because of this, we hope that they had some reasons to start the war. Why? Because like we are like we don't uh, like do anything with politics. So uh, and 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 uh, this like this kind of quotation is, is this quotation is very um, typical. So many people uh, repeated the same thing. Like I know nothing about politics. But those in power, for sure, they know because uh, otherwise they would never start such a big war. So, uh, and it was interesting. So, people uh, supported the decision made by Kremlin uh, to to um, uh, start the war because people uh, believed that uh, the Russian elite uh, had some special knowledge about the world politics that forced them to 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 do so and it is interesting because so we deal here with a, a kind of delegation without representation so people delegate uh, to those in power um, uh, the right to uh, assess a uh, uh, political situation in the world and to start the war but they don't share uh, uh, any um, values or, or interest with, with, with the elite. Uh, so it was in spring. So what uh, happened next? How this support for the war changed? Again, uh, uh, here we, we, we have something very similar to what uh, Ilya described uh, um, uh, about uh, economy. So we have something Mm. in between uh, uh, enthusiastic support and let's say optimization. So uh, people became more patriotic. Uh, they uh, started uh, supporting the war more consciously, but still uh, they are not like big fans of the so-called special military operation. And uh, one um, tendency is uh, very interesting, which is a uh, um, general tendency among different groups uh, from our sample uh, of interviewees. Uh, many people in the very beginning of the war claimed that uh, like, it is a crime, Putin is a criminal, it's a criminal, criminal war, but war and people um, condemned this war, but from moral point of view, not political. So people lack, lacked, uh, in a sense, uh, um, political experience and <coughs> political consciousness, which uh, uh, would be enough to uh, transform this moral um, condemnation of the war into anti-war political position. So, and these people didn't leave Russia. So they uh, stayed in Russia. And so they neither enthusiastically uh, supported the war nor they uh, welcomed this war. So, uh, and they invented a kind of a compromise. So what they told us was like, uh, okay, the war is bad, but it was inevitable. 
So uh, very different people uh, constructed uh, this representation, this image of inevitable war. So even if we don't like this war, we even can um, uh, name it criminal, but in a sense, it was inevitable. So if it is inevitable, uh, we have to support our country, uh, not Ukraine, uh, in this war. And uh, uh, there have been very uh, different arguments uh, in support of this uh, point of inevitability of the world. For example, uh, Russia and the West for uh, many, like for, for much time, like uh, they uh, struggled with each other. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, one day it, it, it should happen. Or, uh, you know, we uh, we uh, uh, were accustomed to live in peace, but you know, uh, war, wars happen um, quite often. Now we understand this. And so, even in Russia, we had Chechen war, uh, we had war in, in, with Georgia, so why not uh, war with Ukraine? Uh, something like this. And <laughs> it is interesting that. Uh, uh, people themselves collectively uh, in dialogue with each other, articulate and create uh, this image of inevitable war. But what does it mean that the war is inevitable for them? It means for them that uh, uh, they cannot do anything with this. So it is something objective, something uh, uh, autonomous from their will. So they themselves create this inevitable war look at this and say, okay, uh, this is like objective reality and we cannot influence upon it at all. Uh, uh, then, uh, of course, uh, people who uh, mm, stayed in Russia, and who uh, were observing uh, uh, the, um, uh, as, as they saw it, like um, and bad attitudes toward, toward Russians in the world. So they started feeling a kind of new patriotism. So people told us like, I never thought about uh, my country, but now I understand that uh, like, this is my country. And it is interesting from a sociological point of view, uh, because uh, uh, we are accustomed to think about Russia as depoliticized and atomized country. But what does it mean, atomization? That people uh, have um, very few social ties uh, with uh, other people uh, outside their families and uh, friendship. And uh, so, but before the war, uh, the fact that people uh, had little ties with, with, with outside society, it meant like that, okay, we, we don't mm, have many connections with other Russians. And that is why like, we don't care about uh, our relationships with other Russians. But now when uh, the uh, country is at war, uh, we have to cherish this very uh, uh, limited and, and, and few connections with, with other people because like we are in, in bad situation. And people started cherishing uh, this um, scare, uh, uh, so this, this, this limited solidarity. So, uh, and, and they started to think, okay, we, we need more solidarity and we uh, have to be uh, like uh, good citizens, and uh, we we have to to care about uh, other Russians. Uh, so uh, somehow uh, somehow they developed uh, a kind of minimal patriotism. Uh, um, then uh, what we uh, also learned from our interviews uh, was that well-to-do people, people who uh, uh, benefited from the war. Uh, because of uh, reasons uh, about which, yeah, 
was talking. Uh, uh, these people um, mm, sub now support the war more enthusiastically. So um, the, uh, the, the interviews uh, show that people who maybe expected that uh, they would lose jobs or uh, lose money. So when they understand that not, we are okay, we have job, or we even uh, are benefited economically from uh, the new economic reality, <laughs> they associate uh, uh, the defense of homeland in the war with defense uh, of their families. So they say something like, yes, uh, I support the special military operation because I support my family, uh, uh, I, because I, I, defense my, I, I, I would defend my family. Um, and uh, uh, these people are uh, 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 even, they declare that they could even go to front line if it, is, it, it would be necessary. And this uh, evidence from the in-depth interviews somehow corroborates uh, 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 opinion polls numbers that people who estimate uh, uh, economic situation in Russia positively, so these people are well-to-do people, people who uh, uh, have stable jobs or, or even benefited from uh, uh, the war. Uh, and again, so <laughs> a lot of focus groups in which we uh, recruited people uh, working in military industrial complex. So uh, what they, what they, like what almost all of them said, like was, uh, uh, to be honest, we don't feel we are now living better than before. Mm. But on the other hand, we feel that uh, we have stable jobs. Because before the war started, we uh, expected we could be fired because our, our factory or, or our uh, salaries uh, uh, were in decrease. Now, even if we are not living better, we know for sure that we will have the job tomorrow. So somehow uh, we uh, have this rise of conscious support, rise of patriotism, uh, but it is still a kind of not very enthusiastic support. So this is stable support for the special military operation, but, but passive support without enthusiasm. <laughs> And uh, the last thing uh, is, uh, it, it was uh, really very interesting. So how they, how they now um, think about Putin. Uh, on the one hand, as I already uh, said, people start to believe that war was inevitable. But at the same time, uh, <laughs> they want this war to uh, be finished as, as, as soon as possible. And they believe that Putin can do it. And many of them, uh, people from different cities, uh, in focus groups, uh, they say like, uh, we will vote for Putin because uh, only such a great politician can finish the special military operation. Uh, so we see that popular support for the war <coughs> is very complex, it's very contradictory. It's in a sense passive, it's not enthusiastic, but still it is somehow stable and uh, we don't know what will happen with this support uh, in near future, but uh, we will continue our research and we'll see. Uh, so I finish here. Yeah. And um, well, my task here is to give some theoretical frame for this, which uh, partially comes from our common research with Alia Jaravlu, partially it comes from our debates with Alia uh, Matveyev. And so some of the points, uh, my individual, some of the points we share. And, um, 
hopefully this uh, would bring some more um, general framework to uh, this empirical analysis. But the first thing to say is that uh, if we are thinking about the either change or stability in the Russian or generally Soviet societies, uh, after the invasion, we need to discuss the, uh, in relation to what, what's exactly is supposed to change, what exactly uh, is going to reproduce. And this uh, goes fundamentally to the debate, what was exactly the post-Soviet condition? And uh, there have been uh, many answers to this question, and uh, the one which started was like offered the first was that the Soviet Union collapsed and we are building democratic societies. And uh, the uh, countries like Russia, Ukraine, maybe lagging behind Poland, or Hungary, or Czech Republic, but nevertheless, uh, in some time, they will be also going the same road. They will be uh, entering the Western institutions. They will be building the same political economic structures. And they will be becoming parts of, of the international West. And uh, the war in 2022, uh, or starting from 2014, will be uh, uh, perceived in the, in the same framework. So this is like the final battle for democracy in the first solid space, where uh, the, the stakes are high, but uh, the win is also huge. Democratization. Uh, the uh, alternative answer was that we actually seen not democratization and those elites that were coming to power in the 1990s, not only in Russia or Belarus, but also in Ukraine, they didn't have any intention to build an actual liberal democracy in our countries. <laughs> but in some countries, uh, the authoritarian regimes happened to be enforced for very specific reasons, much stronger, however, in the countries like Ukraine, uh, the uh, candidates for local Putin or Lukashenko for some reasons were losing. And uh, let's say, speaking about Ukraine, they've had three revolutions during the time of one generation. And also only one president in post Ukraine was capable to win the re-election. It was Leonid Kuchma in 1999. Uh, but uh, otherwise we had like six presidents since 1990s which is kind of like a high uh, rate of turnover of the government. So the governments were not were unstable. And compare with Lukashenko, who is like uh, ruling the country since 1994, or Putin, which or, or, like, exchanged with Medvedev, but basically this is the same regime, at least since uh, the late 1990s. And uh, and even more, or even more so, perhaps if the countries like Hungary, which was in the 1990s, like you know, a beacon for where the Ukraine or Russia is supposed to move. Maybe Orban is actually building a kind of like put it in Hungary. So it's like a reverse direction of, uh, of the change. And again, the invasion could be seen as the uh, uh, final test for this model. That uh, if it survives, that the authoritarian regime is going to be stronger. It would defeat their enemies. It would also create new enemies, which would uh, help to justify the uh, pretty authoritarian local rule. And so the war is also working for this uh, authoritarian consolidation. Uh, a recent narrative, which uh, became very dominant, not, not really dominant, but uh, prominent in uh, since 2022. It's even longer story. What if it, this is simply the final end of the Russian Empire uh, that uh, started in 1917 with the uh, revolutions in Russia? Then the Soviet Union kind of like recreated the uh, Russian Empire and then it collapsed in 1991. And this is the final uh, days of this uh, structure on this part of the, of the planet. And it's also, but basically all these uh, three stories uh, have something in common. They are teleological. There is some pretty certain uh, goal in the end where it's all uh, supposed to end either to liberal democracy or authoritarian, strong authoritarian regimes or whatever. That we may come out from the decolonization, especially in Russia. Uh, that's, and uh, the 
the final say is basically on the in the front lines near Bakhmut, near Bakhmutino, and the, the, the small villages in Ukraine which nobody knew about even in Ukraine, unfortunately, before the events of 20, 2022. Uh, the answer that we have been trying to develop, what if uh, what we've seen in the, in the post Soviet years was, was simply a permanent crisis, N nothing stable, just just the reproduction of degradation, reproduction of crisis, reproduction of um, nothing new that would be capable capable to replace the old. And uh, this is an open and ended story then. And uh, and the question is, uh, what kind of crisis and basically what 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 happens? Uh, uh, what are the efforts for the for the escalating crisis uh, that, that were uh, created by the invention? So the um, what kind of crisis we are at least together with Oleg, but we are analyzing this as a hegemonic crisis, drawing uh, understandably from the Gramscian framework. And as this word is heavily abused, uh, it's always necessary to explain what exactly we mean. But what, what's important for us is the progression of the political uh, formation of social classes. So that's is starting from the very basic um, forms of collective consciousness where for example like miners are thinking about minor interest and they were also organized in the unions of miners and they also strike as miners so but carpenters are organized as carpenters they're thinking about their sectoral interests and uh, not exactly feeling the same interest with miners and so this is like economic corporate consciousness. Then we might think about class consciousness, where carpenters, miners, and tailors, and uh, like university workers, they are thinking about themselves as proletariat. Right? The, the interest of the very broad group that are in the antagonistic relation with the ruling class. But uh, hegemony would be the, when the, uh, let's say, the ruling class is actually capable to present the, its own interests pretty particular as the universal, the national interest. So the interest of the oligarchs are kind of like uh, the same, at least partially, with the interest of the miners, the tailors, carpenters, and so on and so forth. And then can, they're not, not, capable, not only uh, saying this, but the carpenters, tailors, and miners actually believe in this, and they see something in reality that, yes, they, when the people above are benefiting, the people below are benefiting too, at least to some extent. So they're starting to live better. And that becomes kind of like a material ground for um, more enthusiastic support about, about the politics. Something that, for, for example, Alec was just described, it was not, um, uh, is missing in post Soviet countries, or at least in Russia, where there is this disconnection between the values, interests of the people below and the people above. And so uh, this perspective gives uh, has kind of like a broad historical dimension. And uh, probably many of you heard about the book by Alexei Yubchak, which kind of became a classic in Soviet studies, Soviet studies and uh, social anthropology as well. Uh, everything was forever until it was no more. So when uh, the Soviet Union Nobody expected that so the collapse of the Soviet Union, but when it collapsed, nobody was surprised because the system was degenerating for decades before that. So this Soviet Union collapse, which is a zero starting point for many of the analysis and for post-Soviet studies, uh, may not be uh, uh, actually the most disruptive point in this process. Uh, the process started, uh, let's say, in the end of nineteen sixties, where this there was the uh, uh, the more and more acute uh, understanding that the people who are running the country, the communist elite, are not running it in the interest of the Soviet people as a whole. And and this process is something that still continues despite all the events, but this fundamental process uh, may continue or may be disrupted by the invasion. And that's what I'm going to talk, talk, talk later. Even more interesting is the global perspective, which gives, because now, uh, now we are speaking about Russia, Russian specifics, 
on Southern Ukraine would have another specifics. But if you are looking at this as the manifestation of a crisis, we would see it some of the pretty similar problems in many other parts of the world, in many countries, there is a quite prominent discussion that uh, we are ruled by some kind of, um, they may say oligarchs, but um, they, uh, when they say it's differently, let's say like La Casta in Spain or Italy, uh, they, they, they some self-serving elite, which does not think about the national interest, but simply rule the country in the interest of their own. And th this is the manifestation of the hegemony crisis. They are not perceived as the leaders of the country. They are perceived as simply self-serving mafia. Uh, in, in the post soviet part of the world, this is kind of like a by default uh, perception and, uh, and reaction. In other parts of the world, it may, may be not that uh, by default, but nevertheless, the discussion about the crisis of representation, the crisis of democracy, the crisis of legitimacy, why the people are not voting for the traditional parties, why in the United States you're going quite, with quite high probability you're going to elect between Biden and Trump, who are kind of like quite, quite old and is not really liked by many, many parts of, of the American society, but this political system worked in such a way that it, this uh, <laughs> choice, which would not be satisfactory for many, many, many American voters, would be quite likely. And I'm not saying it's, it's exactly what's going to happen, probably nobody can predict it, but that's, uh, that's a part of the reality, it's a part of the possible plausible scenarios for, for the next year. And, and obviously in the European Union, when the reaction to the crisis of traditional elites, uh, the emergence of the New parties, many of them are on the far right, some of them are on the left, and uh, furthermore, the uh, abstention from the voting, and that's why exactly these this new parties are capable to appeal to this part of the ele uh, electorates and so on and so forth. So we we we, we put in the uh, post-Soviet situation in the in the global perspective, and perhaps in 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 the case of Russia and Ukraine, we may see some of the global trends in a, in in more acute forms. And uh, there will there will be no, obviously some some attempts for solutions for, for this crisis. But what's what's interesting that they are, they've been basically they've been deficient. So okay, Lukashenko is kind of like ruling the country for since 1994. But it, the the very fact that he cannot uh, name a successor. That will be safe for himself that he needs to go for the election for the fifth time, for the sixth time, maybe for the seventh time. And finally, he meets kind of like a massive uprising in 2020, which is a huge risk for the political regime. And it was not certain at all that uh, the, the surprising would be uh, repressed. Uh, the very fact that Putin is kind of like also ruling for such a long time, it shows that there is something weak in this system. The much uh, much more stable system works when you can easily switch the the power when Democrats may replace Republicans, Republicans are the replacing the Democrats, but not so much is changing in fact. And this is the political mechanism for uh, securing the power of the ruling class, more stable than the personalist regimes. So this is deficient, uh, def uh, deficient response to the uh, crisis of hegemony in kind of a conservative way. And we also see the revolutions, uh, like Ukrainian revolutions, Armenian revolution, Georgian revolution, I mean, three revolutions in Kyrgyzstan, which are also in weaker regimes and weaker uh, candidates for authoritarians. But the question is why they are not changing uh, what the people were expecting from the, that kind of revolutions. Why it's uh, after overthrowing of uh, an oligarch, Kenukovic, we get uh, we are electing an oligarch Poroshenko when he was uh, the beliefs of the protesters in Yurma, uh, in Yurma and in Ukraine were that this is also a revolution against oligarchs. But it, it never works like this. So uh, the revolution reproduces the, the very same process. And we have like very, very, very long analysis of that, why, why exactly this happens. And why uh, it happens in pretty similar way, why the 
revolutions in the Arab countries or the massive protests in Latin America or in other parts of the world, uh, also not capable to bring substantive radical change, even if they are inspired by those parts of the protesters. And uh, we may also see the start of the war and the continuation of the same crisis. Think about the, uh, for example, uh, the incapacity to, to build um, an attractive uh, developmental project based on the Minsk efforts in Ukraine. Why it, they were perceived as a capitulation for Ukraine. Why there were no, like, uh, the Ukrainian elites, at least part of them were actually supporting the Minsk efforts, and it was also the part of the population which supported the Minsk efforts. However, they were not able to articulate it as the not simply what Russia demands, but what Ukraine needs. They were not capable to articulate it in this, in this way. They were not capable to organize the public uh, to defend the Minsk efforts. And they were not capable to uh, sustain uh, this project. And that was uh, uh, the, one of the biggest factors of their, their favor. Uh, or the uh, uh, Russian incapacity for, to project the soft power, which was like a, a, another way to say hegemony. Why Putin was uh, need, needed to go for the brutal uh, coercion and starting the invasion uh, against the country where there was historically a very big part of the population in support of Russia. Or at least they were not thinking, uh, it's not exactly the most precise way to, to, to put it, but nevertheless, the, uh, Russia was indeed not seen as, uh, as an enemy. Now it is seen as an, enemy, as an enemy for a very obvious reason. And also the global uh, dimension of, of, of this crisis, when the United States is uh, having less and less capacity to project its leadership and to not simply to project, but also to sustain. And the uh, war in Ukraine is also one of the many, many manifestations of this uh, degradation of the, the American global hegemony. Uh, Gaza uh, is obviously another one, and uh, the potential crisis in the Taiwan another one, and then the escalation and like Nagorno-Karabakh and, and Kosovo and many, many parts of the world where the American power is, sometimes it can be uh, sustained, but in other parts it can be sustained. And this is the point of an opportunity for the people like Putin, a, a way to, uh, and time when they are capable to use the escalating global crisis to improve their rel relative position in the global hierarchy. And uh, so one one way would be to say that uh, what we see in uh, Russia and also in Ukraine is kind of like a continuation, maybe intensification of the same crisis tendency. So the response of the Russians is kind of like not exactly uh, kind of like hegemonic, the enthusiastic support for the war, for Putin. That's not what we've seen in the empirical studies. So maybe th this is kind of like the continuation of the same crisis tendencies. However, uh, I also think that we need to be attentive to the, some of the uh, seeds or elements of something new that may emerge. So, uh, in, yeah, uh, oops, yeah, yeah, military attention is the first. Uh, the, Ilya has already mentioned this, uh, what the uh, massive uh, social payments which were started last year with the uh, intensification of the military production create, this create the material by basis for different kinds of support. So there, there, there might be quite broad groups of the Russian society, not saying the majority, but there could be the uh, specific groups of the beneficiaries in the war who start to get uh, stable jobs, who start to receive uh, higher payment, uh, and who uh, would start to connect the war or aggressive foreign policy by Russia with their immediate material interests. It's not saying that like the majority of Russians are ben benefiting from the war, it's nothing like this, but nevertheless, the people who work in the military industrial complex, the people who work in the state in, uh, enterprises or in a certain way are um, connected to that. Furthermore, if, if this Kenshin mechanisms are going to work that may have um, kind of like multiplying effect 
for the Russian economy in general, and also the civilian sectors might, might uh, feel uh, the improvement with the war. And what it uh, changes, what might potentially change in, in support for the war, uh, kind of like a positive feedback loop. The more uh, successful the war uh, is, is waged, the more resources that it requires, the more uh, the bigger groups in the Russian society uh, may be benefiting from that, and this have, has the implications for the whole Russian economy, for the whole uh, political regime. And then the nation building uh, argument, which is um, in the discussion about the Russian ideology or Russian politics, something I think uh, underestimated. So we are, we are analyzing it typically as imperialism, as fascism. Um, like the problem is that when you, um, I, I mean, we can look at, at these terms as kind of like elements for um, for nationalism. Uh, in in the discussion on Russia, there's been always the the uh, an argument that as, uh, as a result of the Russian imperial history, the Russian nation, in fact, has been underdeveloped. So Russia had an empire, but did it have a nation? And the uh, view of Ukrainians uh, in a certain uh, aspect is uh, not so much about imperialism, but also about nationalism. So the claim that we are one of the same people is fundamentally a nationalistic claim. It's not uh, the empire builds an hierarchy of nations. Basically, there's are many people under one rule. And typically, there are hierarchies that are better and, uh, and worse. Uh, the nationalist claim is actually we are the same people, we all united. And uh, historically, this uh, narrative about one is the same people was basically the, a narrative about nation. So, what if uh, we see now is a kind of like the uh, Russian nation group? There's, uh, there's also a Ukrainian uh, story about that, that in response to the Russian invasion, Ukrainians are finally kind of united, consolidated, and decided about all the, uh, the internal disagreements and so on and so forth. Uh, but what, what if we are seeing this in, in, the, in the Russian case as well? And uh, the uh, military economy may provide material basis War for this nation building, then where when it's not simply the claim that we are sharing the same interests, so we are we need to vote for Putin once again, we need to support some kind of what, what I like described as patriotism by, by default. But what if we may see the uh, organic connection of the uh, at least some of the interest of some of the, the broader groups within the subaltern classes with the interest of the Russian elite? which becomes the basis for the, for the nation. And uh, finally, this is the question about the class formation, because uh, always these claims of the ruling class that we are leading the country in the interest of the whole, they are never uh, complete. There is always a gap. The, and the, the, what may change now that if in the post-Soviet situation, the, the ideological claims of the elite were not taken seriously. After the invasion, they may be, they start to be taken ser seriously. And when they are starting to be taken seriously, this is a point for uh, articulating the criticism. So you promised this, but what we are seeing in the reality is completely different. This is the sources for the crack of, of the room. And this may create the potential for, for counter hegemonies in, in, in the Russian society, in post Soviet uh, uh, space in, in general, which is not necessarily what we are, might see in the next years, but this is like a longer process, you know, longer uh, the process for perhaps decades, but which may have uh, an optimistic end. That's it. So we are now um, 
going to open up space for questions. And I'm going to take some questions from the audience and I'm going to take some questions from uh, Zoom participants. If you are on Zoom and want to ask a question, you know, do the yellow hand raising thing so I can see you. Um, but I'm going to take a quick advantage of me being here and I'm going to ask the first question if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so I know that Ilya said that there's no tensions right now seen, right? And I understand that, right? But um, I was wondering if there are any kind of um, regional variations that we can see and spe specifically, you know, things like Keynesian uh, militarism, for example, right? Is is it uh, uniformly applied across the region and sectors? I mean, from what I understand, military industrial complex, right? Benefits from it. So people from that sector benefit um, and regions that have that sector benefit the most. Um, but uh, there should be some kind of uh, differences, variations, right? Can we see differences in public opinion based on this variation? Right. So I'll try to answer this uh, shortly. Uh, it's an interesting question because uh, the region that actually lost uh, the most because of the war is Moscow as the most globalized part of Russia, the most uh, integrated uh, territory that has the most connections with the outside world, especially economic connections. And so the Moscow is actually the biggest loser, but at the same time, it's uh, such a gigantic advanced economy that Moscow was able to adapt even to this new situation. And uh, other regions, they did not lose as much because they were less connected to the world, less dependent on uh, uh, service industries, uh, global companies, and so on. And uh, in those regions, also the poorest strata in society could benefit from uh, becoming soldiers, going to war and earning money on the front. So uh, there is unevenness, but somehow it's all balanced out, you know, because uh, the richest regions, they lost uh, the most resources, the most money, but they somehow managed to adjust just because they are already quite advanced. And the poorest regions, they even sometimes gained something because... Uh, those uh, enterprises in the military industrial complex, they are located all across Russia, basically. It's not like there is just one region where it's all concentrated and uh, uh, salaries increased, employment increased. So this was beneficial for many regional economies. And uh, for the poorest people, you know, going to war was also a way of making money. So I would say that uh, in general, it's a kind of balanced story, even though there are geographical variations. Questions, anybody in the audience? I have a question. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm international relations major student, and uh, I'm from China. So I'm in, and uh, I grew up in China. So I know the relationship between China and Russia is uh, like they align. Uh, they are in the same uh, like alley. Um, so I'm thinking about in this war, uh, how Russia, uh, how China can, can help Russia to have a stable globalized uh, um, uh, position, and uh, how to how China can help or how they interact with each other for the economic way. Yeah, I can answer this one as well. So um, the interesting thing is that uh, China never wanted a conflict with the West as much as uh, the Kremlin wanted a conflict with the West. So in this, between these two parties, the Kremlin is much more aggressive and more reckless, and Chinese authorities are more careful. But at the same time, uh, there are structural tensions between China and the United States in particular. So economic tensions that uh, work, even though like Chinese authorities don't really want to have this conflict, still there are like structural economic reasons for it. And then Russia accelerated the situation with its completely reckless foreign policy that, in my personal opinion, is not rooted in the structural economic factors, it's rooted in ideological factors. So, but at the same time, this has an impact on China. And uh, this uh, accelerates the situation where China is in conflict with the West 
And now there are basically, it's a new version of the Cold War. So uh, there is this global conflict and Russia gets closer and closer to China and uh, China, you know, economically decouples from the West and uh, this division of the world is accelerated by Russia's actions. Even though there were structural reasons for this conflict and for this division, still Russia made this process more rapid because of this voluntaristic decision to start the war and basically change everything in the world, not just in the region, not just in Russia and Ukraine, but change everything in the world because the war has these global consequences. What is interesting also is what we can learn from analysis available uh, is like a similar kind of stabilization because this analysis tells us that uh, first, uh, China believed that uh, Russia will uh, win uh, the war uh, very fast. And after um, um, the first weeks and months, uh, Russia was like uh, a kind of disappointed and distant distance uh, it's, it's all from from Russia but then again uh, after this structural tensions uh, uh, I mentioned uh, somehow uh, became uh, more intense uh, just because partly because of the war itself so finally uh, China again uh, started seeing Russia is very close ally and now uh, 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 expects and is ready for some long-term conflict against the West together with Russia. Um, let's take a question from uh, Lori Calhoun on Zoom. Thank you for all of you to do. I you know, appreciate all of your work. Uh, Vladimir, Alek, and Ilya. I just have a question. I just read this article that came out in Post-Soviet Affairs. I don't know if you've seen it by Alexeyev and Pyle called A Blind and Militant Attachment, Russian Patriotism in Comparative Perspective. Um, and it talks, it traces Russian patriotism as particularly blind and militant compared to other countries. It uses like statistics in the World Values Survey. And it says that it became actually blind and militant. It was already like that in 1991. And so they can't figure out if it was like that before Soviet collapse or emerged in 91, but that it's been pretty consistent and hasn't changed since the early 90s. And so my question is maybe both to um, Alek. I'm curious about the nature of the patriotism that you have sussed out in your sociological work. Um, you said it's unenthusiastic, but does there feel like there is some kind of, uh, that there's an association with sort of the militancy of the regime that's somehow positive, uh, that, that helps people figure out that they're patriots, right? The sort of militant nature of Putin's kind of right ideological work. And then uh, Vladimir, I also wonder, you talk about right, nation building right now. Uh, and, and do you think that, right, the sort of the militancy helps kind of Russians imagine themselves in a new way? Uh, is that an essential component of nation building um, or, or not? So anyway, you know, maybe you probably haven't seen the article, but I'm curious about, uh, that the blind and militant part of, of Russian patriotism seems to stick out from other um, Eastern European and Western European nations. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So I would say that uh, it is important that Russian patriotism, I mean, uh, patriotism among ordinary Russians, so not uh, among uh, radical nationalist uh, uh, groups, Russian patriotism uh, was not very much politicized. So, okay, it's it's similar to, uh, I don't remember the author of the Banner, Banner Nationalism. Um, that, oh, oh, uh, no, uh, but I mean, so Banner Nationalism is like, uh, or Banner Patriotism is like everyday patriotism. So, okay, I have the Russian passport. I, 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 I know like the colors of uh, my flag and, uh, 
So when I crossed the border and I showed my passport to, to border uh, guard, so uh, he uh, like said, okay, I, I, I know Tchaikovsky and Dostoevsky and Belly and uh, sports. Uh, so, and uh, it is important that uh, Russian, it is what uh, Valody explained like that uh, uh, hegemonic process uh, is when your corporate or particular identities uh, then somehow integrated in more universalistic identity and agenda. So I'm Russian because uh, I earn a lot of money, uh, my living standards are uh, high because I live in Russia. I also uh, know my uh, uh, political tradition, like, like, uh, like in the United States uh, uh, where uh, patriotism, for example, is uh, uh, integrated with uh, the idea of democracy. Uh, also by now, but still. So, and what does it mean? Uh, that Russian patriotism is not very much politicized or rooted in corporate interests. Uh, it, it means that this minimalistic nature of patriotism uh, makes it vulnerable to appropriation from the most powerful uh, uh, stakeholder, from the state. So when we interviewed uh, people, who came to the streets to protest against the special military operation in Russia. So uh, we asked them, like, why did you uh, go to the, to, the, to, the, to the streets? And people replied, uh, we uh, don't think that we can influence uh, the decision making. So we cannot stop the war, but we want to show uh, to the world, to Ukrainians and to other Russians, that we are like that anti war Russians do exist. So somehow they feel this lack of uh, oppositional patriotism. So uh, uh, that is why uh, uh, mm, this minimalistic, this banal nature of patriotism led to the situation in which, after the war started, uh, people. Uh, uh, became patriots in like this still banal but new sense. Okay, I have the Russian passport. Uh, I know Dostoevsky and Tchaikovsky, and also I have the war with Ukraine. So I I want my my country to to win this war. Uh, um, and uh, this lack of oppositional or 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 uh, non-conformist patriotism, which was in the right before the war, but not enough. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, led to this patriotism uh, now appropriated uh, by uh, by the state. Um, if I, if I may add to this, I, I I didn't read this paper, so I'm I'm not even sure what what he meant by uh, more militant patriotism. So in in the analysis, Valek uh, and other. And the people the uh, we see are the passive Russians, like maybe it's banal patriotism. Uh, but what what was uh, interesting for me is uh, the uh, because I'm I'm also obviously following the discussion about Ukrainian nationalism and what what happens uh, with that in in response to the Euromaidan and then to the invasion and then how the uh, uh, like the whole nation consolidated and. Like 70% are donating for the Ukrainian armed forces. And so the people are becoming more patriotic. They're thinking about themselves as foremost as Ukrainian citizens. So this is a claim for like civic nationalism, uh, which blinds many people to see ethnic nationalism behind it. Uh, and, and it's not simply the, the feeling that they, uh, many people are ready to contribute something to the national cause. But on the other side of the front line, we see that Putin is uh, given the, the re, 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 referring to this similar kind of statistics, like that uh, almost 90% of the Russian citizens think, uh, think about themselves as Russian citizens, not as uh, representatives of the many of the national groups 
in uh, there was Russia, and he uses the same kind of statistical arguments that uh, the uh, this uh, researcher from Soviet National in Ukraine. And, we, and another interesting figure is uh, comes from the service in the borderline regions of Russia, Belgorod, Kursk, uh, and Bransk. Uh, which uh, which have been from from a certain period of time and the targets of attacks from Ukraine and also this small scale invasion of these uh, supposedly Russian volunteers coordinating with Ukrainian intelligence and Russian legion and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and in response to those invasions, the local residents are starting to self-organize. And furthermore, the uh, uh, surveys are showing that the support for the war in those regions are especially high. And furthermore, uh, if they, they show the figure something like over 50, over 60 percent uh, contribute something to the, to the Russian military. And so we, we see the, the, the uh, is it exactly the same reaction? So you are getting attacked, or at least in this very narrow perspective. Those uh, the residents who live in those regions are attacked, and then they are starting to feel more patriotic, more supportive of the war. They're starting to mobilize, to self-organize, uh, to defend themselves. And, and in this comparative perspective, it may sure say something about the the, the the nature of the change in nationalism uh, in Ukraine and also in Russia. Um. I mean, this may be more specifically for like but anybody. And uh, like you spoke about class formation in, with particular emphasis to uh, to to the beneficiaries of, of the war. But uh, I mean, even if we limit ourselves to, to the economy, probably the number of losers of the war would be would be greater. And if we include casualties and another aspects of the of the war, you know that that number uh, should should increase even uh, even higher. So I'm just wondering uh, about those processes of class formations among opponents to the war, about uh, uh, both uh, pos the possibilities of class interclass alliances uh, between uh, you know middle class opponents of the war who you know, would have opposed for moral reasons, Navalny supporters uh, with with working class uh, uh, people who are seeing their incomes and economic possibilities reduced. Uh, and, and so, yes, that would be, and, and maybe more, more broadly, um, uh, I mean, because we really do not see <laughs> immediately and unfortunately, any prospects of, of or clear paths of a regime change, but uh, under what conditions do you think um, do you think uh, the population itself is opposed to a certain economic or political elite that that could organize a coup? But under what conditions uh, opposition from below could become uh, a factor in? Um, yeah, thank you. So it's very difficult question, but what we can say from interviews, which are even not analyzed systematically, I mean, all of them, but what we see is that along with the fact that those who benefit from the war uh, support more, the same. Uh, but the opposite we see like with those who, who lose. So people we uh, people who lost resources or lost ability or who feel uh, for example that they lack uh, some safety or they suffer from even from uh, new political rea reality, not in terms of repression, but when in a court you cannot defend yourself because institutions are not working. So yeah, these people 
uh, even if they are not uh, opponents, uh, open opponents of the war, they become much more critical of the special military operation. Unfortunately, we stopped studying opponents, like open opponents of the war. And maybe we will come back to this group. So we focused from uh, from from summer of 2022, we decided to focus on not opponents, so supporters and uh, undecided people. <laughs> but even within this group, we see that uh, uh, so we don't speak anymore with supporters of Navalny, uh, but uh, with um, uh, among those people who are neutral or in support of the war, we, we see that if people start living worse than before, uh, yes, many of them become much more skeptical uh, of the war. But we very hard to say what, what will happen next. Mm -hmm. yeah. I also <laughs> add that uh, the simple fact is that Russia now has 3% uh, unemployment. So Russian economy is basically close to full employment. Mm -hmm. And it's not really clear that from the economic standpoint, more people lost than gained you know, because of the war. So uh, it's true that industries such as automobile production, they were basically almost completely destroyed. But at the same time, workers in these industries managed to find uh, new employment very quickly because there is a general condition of the labor shortage, right? And uh, materially speaking, people who, who lost because of the war, these are middle classes from large urban centers. So most of these people actually left the country and it doesn't matter, unfortunately, for political situation in Russia. So people like us, I mean, we try to do something, but I, I, I have no illusion that uh, it has a lot of influence on the situation inside the country. So, um, and like, this is the economy, this is the class question. Of course, there is a separate question of, uh, uh, dozens of thousands of people who lost their loved ones in the war itself. And this is, I mean, they're grieving and obviously they have, they probably have strong opinions about the war. So, but like Alex said, we didn't study it. And uh, th this is separate from the economy. And I feel that economically, this is precisely uh, the reason why we suspect that there's something new and stable is emerging, that in fact, uh, people are employed, their condition is even more stable than before. So despite inflation, you know, uh, real incomes are kind of keeping up with inflation because employers are afraid of losing workers because of this very low unemployment. So workers are paradoxically in a, in a rather strong position at the moment, you know, despite this economic upheaval connected with the war. And so um, I, I can't say that more people lost than one, you know, economically, Econ but, but of course they're, uh, attitudes towards the war itself, this is a different thing. This is, uh, this should be studied, uh, well, in connection to the economic situation, but it's just a question of another, another research, I think. And if I may add, this is uh, uh, one of the conclusions of the paper which we co-authored about Russian military tension is that it may have, uh, contra at least uh, it has no contradictory, uh, may have a contradictory effect on the support of the war and the, it has a, a kind of like an economic background. So the uh, military tension is in the United States uh, during the Second World War and during the Cold War, war was uh, working in the, on the condition of uh, at least initial high unemployment. So in 1940, the unemployment rate in the US was almost 15% of the country was uh, coming out from the Great Depression. There was uh, a large number of the reserve labor force. Uh, in Russia, it's 3%, right? And it, it creates a problem of the labor shortage. Uh, it means that the pension policies might not, um, at least partially, may not uh, contribute to the development of the civilian sectors, but may actually rob all the workers from the civilian sectors to the military. Uh, sectors. Uh, one of the outcomes that uh, we and some other uh, analysts have already noted is the overheating of the Russian economy and also contribution to the inflation. And then we see the groups which uh, in, in the Russian society which have not that much uh, benefited from the uh, this military spendings. However, they already felt the uh, uh, 
the inflation, the rise in prices. Yeah. And uh, you analyzed an example of one person who is kind of a, a, a typical audience of the military bloggers in Russia, so pretty jingoistic and has a very peculiar view of the war. But in the course of the um, I mean, first year of the war, he becomes more critical about the prospects of Russia, about the prospects of the war, more critical about it, and articulates the economic grievances. The prices are going up, and the people like me are losing. And, but obviously that requires uh, more analysis, and we also need to understand that the problem of labor shortage, I mean, we can imagine the solution for that, like inviting more migrant labor, or there are discussions about inviting more like teenagers to work and starting from 14 you know, I mean, that, that's not that those people could work. Of course, they would be taken out from the education system. And also, and also prison labor. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, it's important. Uh, so uh, we expected that facing uh, uh, some problems caused by the war, uh, people will somehow politicize the land. So we don't see it. But what we see from our last uh, field research, both focus groups and ethnography uh, in different Russian regions, we see that uh, people who uh, mm, uh, personally uh, face uh, the war reality, so they uh, uh, react with uh, very intense moral disputes over eco new economic uh, uh, things. We still cannot say if it is part of class formation, but people uh, uh, discuss with each other, okay, uh, her, her husband uh, died in the war, and uh, uh, in a month uh, she uh, uh, bought a car and uh, went to a disc, uh, very, very bad war. Or uh, uh, his uh, son died in the war, and uh, he uh, uh, bought the car, uh, stupid idiot, he better uh, buy uh, a flat, not a car, so he doesn't know how to spend money. Or, also in group terms, so in focus groups, people uh, say something like, uh, yes, we work in military industrial conflict, but these IT people, they are, like, uh, they benefit a lot, uh, a lot, not, not, not like us. So, there are some moral uh, uh, intense discourse about persons and groups uh, which now restructure this uh, social imaginary. And we will see uh, again what, 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 how, it, how it will change over time. Um, then Andrea Leo. Okay, um, I had a question for Professor Sh Shenko. Um, you mentioned the uh, the Minsk Accords, and I was just wondering if you had any commentary on, um, I'm putting it in the chat right now, the, uh, the admission by Angela Merkel that um, the West had just used the Minsk, Minsk Accords as a pretext to delay, to de basically so that Ukraine could build up its, um, you know, it's basically it could remilitarize. And as, as you know, um, France and Germany were the two parties that were responsible for enforcing the Minsk Accords, and of course, they totally, um, you, you know, ignored their responsibility. So I'm just curious how you context contextualize that element. And my second question for you is, um, I know we were talking about Russian patriotism, and I, uh, well, the reason I came to this talk is because I'm um, a big fan of your, that uh, essay you wrote in the New Left Review about, um, that was very critical of Ukrainian nationalism, and talking about how Ukrainian na nationalism is always pitted uh, you know, in opposition, uh, Ukrainian nationalism since, since February 2022 has basically been just denigrating Russia and saying that everything to do with Russia is bad. And I know that that was, I'm curious if you want to talk about that. I, I know that that was, that had a very controversial reception, but I was really grateful to hear a Ukrainian person be critical of Ukrainian nationalism since the war. Thank you. Uh -oh. What is the question about the second one? Um, I guess, I guess my first question is to do with Minsk Accords, because you, because you mentioned that, and 
the fact that I put it in the chat that um, Angela Merkel admitted that the Minsk Accords was always a ruse by the West to that they had ne I'm never. Um, well, because we were talking the, in the last question, we talked about Russian patriotism and we're very critical of Russian patriotism. So I'm just curious because your article, which I've just put in the chat here, was very critical of Ukrainian patriotism. And I'm just curious if you want to comment on that. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm just uh, said quite a lot about that, so I'm not sure I need to, to repeat that uh, thing. And I mean, because Ukrainian Russian uh, nationalism could be uh, assessed critically, and I mean. I just, I just don't, don't, don't take the question about that, about the Minsk Accords. Uh, uh, well, that's uh, so, uh, the, the, the role in the West and their failure is something that, uh, that should be investigated more. So the, uh, well, even whatever they are saying now in the interviews, the fact is that the uh, uh, contribution of the uh, France and Germany on the one side, also the United States, which was kind of like keeping themselves kind of like separate and the efforts also Russia were actually would be uh, quite interested to involve them into that discussion about the, about the Ukrainian future and the, the ways uh, how to deal with that. Uh, so, uh, the, the very least that could be said is that many opportunities were missed and not enough was done. To, 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 to put it simply. Uh, but if you... Uh, the, uh, I recently had, a, an, I had an article in the Russian Politics Academic Journal uh, which analyzes the failure of the Minsk Accords from the domestic pain and perspective. And, uh, and I think this is something that uh, the most under discussed. Uh, most of the discussions about that are like the Russian role in their failure, the Western role in their failure. And I can understand why, why there's so, so much enthusiasm for that debate. Uh, but the, the, the most interesting question for me, and also partially as a Ukrainian, and because because of the origin, but also because of the more um, theoretical uh, implication from that analysis, and not simply to 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 to, to find the the state who is like to be the blame the most for the war, but uh, why uh, the ruling classes in Ukraine? We're not capable to build a nation building project based on the uh, uh, at least partial uh, overlap of Ukrainian and Russian interests. So, why the Minsk Accords were perceived by so many in Ukraine as simply as not a way for uh, a possible Ukrainian development in a more like pluralistic context, but simply as a uh, brutal demand from Russia to, to be imposed on Ukraine. Which was only partial true about that. But it's, uh, it should not be assumed that it was the only, the only way to be interpreted in the Ukrainian society. So that would be my answer for that. Yes, hey, thanks for the talks. <clears throat> I wanted to ask about the fascism analogy because my, my sense is that traditionally understanding of fascism and what differentiates it between from other kinds of even very repressive <clears throat> authoritarian nationalism is the strong political ideological mobilization and that you have these kinds of party movements and the movement part is really crucial there uh, and it seems like what you guys are describing in Russia is actually pretty shallow ideological mobilization and support for the war so isn't that at odds with with that kind of description that is why we cannot uh, name uh, Russia fascist because it lacks 
uh, enthusiastic ideological support, so supportive, like mm -hmm. so it's um, um, so we can say about some tend tendencies towards fascization, but uh, maybe Ilya has different uh, uh, view yeah. of it, and we can uh, say uh, about maybe that Russian political elite and political regime is closer to to to, to fascism than the society itself, but. Uh, uh, yeah, so of course, a uh, Russian society lacks ideological and enthusiastic uh, mobilization and support. That is why it is hard to 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 name it fascist in classical uh, sense of the word. Yes, but on the other hand, it's true that there might not be a massive popular support and popular movement at the moment, but it is emerging. It is emerging, and this is why this tendency towards fascism is present. I agree that, uh, well, there is this huge debate about fascism like in general and fascism in Russia in particular, but and I agree that some kind of movement component needs to be present uh, and kind of general mobilization needs to be present so that we can call this country fascist, but we see precisely this tendency. And uh, what is the most alarming is that uh, this ideological indoctrination reaches the education system and penetrates the whole education system. And in my opinion, this kind of differentiates uh, this fascist condition from uh, uh, just a very authoritarian system. So when in every school, in every class in the country, you have every week a propagandistic lesson that explains what's going on from uh, you know the perspective of the Kremlin. This looks not just like authoritarianism; that looks like fascism to me, because ultimately it does generate a more active support. And I think uh, Alex's presentation was a bit ambivalent. So he said things like contradictory and complex, but what he meant was that it's not just <laughs> <laughs> it just passive. So <laughs> because if it was just passive. So Support, then you would have said uh, it's just passive support without any contradictory and complex things. But uh, as I understood, Alec, and uh, yeah, so my, my interpretation of his uh, point is that there is growing tendency towards more uh, uh, active support for the war. You know, people uh, recognizing more and more this war as their own and this regime as their own, and they're willing to donate, you know, money for some war-related causes, even go to the front. And actually, uh, tens of thousands of people in Russia go to the front as so-called volunteers, not as professional army corps, but, but as volunteers. So it's not a huge number, but it is still significant. And so this thing is just developing. Yes, it doesn't develop uh, very fast because Putin's regime it organically is not fascist, right? So it's not uh, it's not this kind of regime. It's not based on uh, movementism. It's not based on mobilization, but it is moving in this direction. And this is why I think it's not uh, you know baseless to say that it's moving in the fascist direction. So there are signs of it emerging at the moment. But again, but, uh, I, I, may I briefly reply uh, uh, because we are referred to uh, you. Again, I want to repeat that we have to be accurate uh, both in, in, in terms and interpretation of empirical data. So yes, people can uh, conceive the war more as their war, but not the Putin's regime. So many of them vote for Putin because he has to finish the special military mm -hmm. and to finish all of this. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, so not not uh, uh, not full grain between us and in, in, in this, but yes, some tendencies are present and some counter tendencies are present as well. Very close to the discussion. Uh, one of uh, I mean, there, there are many schools to interpret fascism, and um, well, again, our. Uh, friend and comrade Ilya Bogratsky has a, like a big article that Russia now is a fascist country where he has to make this argument uh, uh, 
analyzing fascism as a kind of like extreme uh, tendency of capitalism to utterization of the of the society and where he actually uh, he actually comes to quite contradictory and uh, interesting conclusion that perhaps in the 1990s Russia was at least according to this definition could be even more fascist when it was even more uh, atomized than Russia after the after the invasion of Ukraine and so the, the different school of thought which uh, I mean I, I I find more convincing partially for the reason that uh, I was a student of Dylan Riley uh, a sociologist from Berkeley who published a very important book on the civic foundations of fascism in Europe in the 1930s, where he makes a very strong argument that fascism was actually the, the regime built on very organized society, not atomized, but very organized, organized in the multiple associations, in the unions, and so on and so forth, which was like the basis of the regime. The whole idea of fascism is that we do not need politics, it's simply the group's interest would, would be directly implemented by the, by, by the fascist party. And we don't need this uh, blah, blah, blah politicians, parliaments, and all of that. We are just building corporate society. But corporate societies mean that it does have very strong corporatism. And this is like a huge difference from any Soviet society where corporatism is extremely weak. And that's a question about the capacity of fascism. But the uh, tendencies that are, may now emerge, but they may not really necessarily realize in the in the long term, is that um, again, fascism is rising from the huge imperialist war, the first world war, in the countries which lost that war. And so it's uh, the uh, this connection between the invasion and fascism may be a little different. It's not that it's because of the, the fascistic uh, tendencies of what, what Maria Sorokin was mentioning, this kind of like almost uh, historical uh, tendency of Russian patriotism to militancy and to some extremism from the 1990s. Uh, this is why we are having this war. It's uh, the opposite process. The invasion and the uh, possible defeat of Russia may create the conditions of some, some real fascist price. Um, next is Gautam, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce last name, Chakrabarti. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and yes, that was Chakrabarti's right. Um, uh, first of all, I'm sorry to have missed the first talks in this fascinating thing sort of joining in from Berlin is not always that easy, but thank you so much for this fascinating discussion and to Rossin and the others for organizing this. Um, uh, I have a couple of points very briefly. One is about uh, the broader issue of decolonization slash uh, um, a, a sort of unpacking of the colonial imperial charges of um, former Soviet states or uh, non former non-Russian Soviet states. Now, we've. Uh, I took a quick look at the article circulated on the chat, and I've also been following up over the last couple of years on this. And I do agree with the points made in the article, the broad points about the limited nature of uh, the decolonization project with reference to Ukraine. But I was wondering uh, what uh, the August speakers would have to say about uh, the nature, what what is it in in the Soviet in what is loosely and not very correctly termed Soviet modernity? To what extent is uh, Russian scholarship aware and reflective of the fact that a lot of Soviet solidarity, a lot of Soviet internationalism, while being genuinely anti-colonial and genuinely anti-imperial? also had certain theoretical dependencies on, uh, shall we say, late 19th century, early 20th century, quote-unquote, Western theory. So to what extent is uh, Russian scholarship today interested in uh, decolonizing from this perspective? So sort of 
uh, sort of trying to look back at what can be retrieved from Russian traditions of sociology, anthropology, ethnology, and so on. And if I'm allowed, may I ask a quick second question, if that's okay? Thank you. The second question would be about China. So uh, there was this fascinating uh, question and answer session about, and also before that, uh, about this, uh, the sort of un quote unquote uneasy relationship between Chinese geopolitical projections and uh, the fact that the Russians have kind of helped China with this uh, war slash special military operation, but also forced China's hand. Now, uh, from, I'm, I'm originally from India, and the, the consensus in Indian IR thinking over the last couple of years, so people like Brahmachalani, people like Samir Saran, people like Amitabh Matju, they have been, so there is a rough consensus of on the fact that although uh, the, the situation in Ukraine is really from a medium to short term perspective, really of interest for China and you know, all sorts of terms are being bandied about resource cannibalization, so on and so forth, client state. But there is a certain, so, but, but I was wondering what the panelists would say about the, the notion that actually uh, China is, the People's Republic of China is a bit of the, His Majesty's opposition when it comes to its relationship with uh, the United States of America. So there are Indian uh, IR theorists who even call the People's Republic of China America 2.0, because in terms of uh, sort of state capitalism, in terms of a very blatant use of uh, capitalist techniques of extraction of labor, the Chinese are basically upping the US ante, upping the liberal, libertarian ante. So to what extent is it fair to look at China and the, the People's Republic of China and the United States as oppositional entities uh, in, in a long-term geopolitical sense. Pasiba Balshoi. So I'll, I'll try to not take too long with my answer. I mean, uh, we're not specialists in uh, decolonization. So, uh, my impression is that it's just a very complex field in which there are a lot of paradoxes. So uh, the Soviet Union is presented as an empire with some reason, but then uh, uh, the Kremlin at the moment rejects the Soviet legacy as kind of anti-imperialist and wants to return to the Russian empire. That was an actual empire, even in the name, right? So if the Kremlin rejects the Soviet legacy so strongly, why do we find the Soviet Union so uncontroversially imperialist, right? If, if there is such a strong reaction towards the Soviet Union. So that's the one paradox. Another paradox is that uh, Russia has always had some imperial features. But at the same time, uh, in terms of kind of the consciousness of the Russian people, uh, there's also a subaltern element. So it's an empire, but it's also kind of dominated by this feeling uh, of uh, subalternity, subalternity towards the West, right? So on the one hand, it's an empire. On the other hand, it's some kind of subaltern subject. And so there is this book... Uh, by Vyacheslav Morozov, subaltern empire. So a lot of different sides to this question, difficult to answer it, you know, in, in one short answer during, during the panel. And uh, China and the United States, uh, again, I'll just try to answer very shortly. My impression is that it's true that in the previous Cold War, we had two completely different systems. The United, like the, the Western world, the capitalist world, and the Soviet world that was not capitalist. At the moment, we have two capitalist blocks. And so they are kind of similar in the sense they practice uh, the capitalist economy and exploitation. And uh, there's huge inequality, both in the West and in China itself. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that these two capitalist blocks cannot be uh, fighting each other. So yes, they are similar. They're organized in a similar manner to some extent, but at the same time, they can have these contradictions precisely because they are two capitalist blocks. And we saw that before the Second World War, actually. So there were 
uh, you know, like economic and political blocks, but they were all uh, organized in a similar manner as colonial capitalist empires. And so they eventually had this world war. So maybe at the moment where in the same historical situation where we have two capitalist blocks, unlike the Cold War, but there are real contradictions, both structural and ideological between them. And there could be a real possibility even of an open conflict. So the situation is very precarious, very unstable, very dangerous at the moment, not just with Russia and the United States, but also with China and the United States, because Taiwan can flare up easily. This is not guaranteed. This is not going to be you know, a new war. In my opinion, we saw with you know Ukrainian war that these things can happen very unexpectedly. And with Taiwan, despite the fact that it looks like it just doesn't make sense for China you know, to invade Taiwan, well, the same thing was said about Russia. So it just doesn't make sense to invade Ukraine. And now we are where we are. So I think that's a, it's a dangerous situation and a real conflict between these two capitalist sides. I would briefly say that uh, as left-wing and as post-Soviet people and as social scientists, we are really interested in uh, the Soviet society and Soviet state. And uh, But from the point of view of this crisis of hegemony approach, so when we analyze crisis of hegemony in post-Soviet countries, as Volodya already said, like we uh, think it uh, started to develop in late 60s and beginning of 70s. And saying that, I mean that uh, we see what uh, developed after the October Revolution as a hegemonic project, which declined. Uh, gave rise to this uh, crisis of hegemony in which we uh, uh, are now. So we 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 study and we are interested in, in, in uh, Soviet reality from this point of view. With Soviet tradition of social sciences, is, this is like much more complicated because tradition is not very very, very fruitful and. and Partially, social science sciences were just prohibited before the before the before sixties. All right, so um, we're gonna ask one more question. Um, Grigory, right? Is that? Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, I was actually asking Grigory. Uh, it was about the military issue. Uh, I mean, uh, I. Every, everyone has been following the uh, debates uh, on whether uh, the war might be actually uh, beneficial for the Russian weakness, but for the oligarchs, I will decide with you. I mean, I, I'm very good for this. But still, this, this idea of military tension is uh, kind of odd to me. Because if it's uh, it's really uh, a solution to you know to this uh, crisis of, uh, of the economy that was that was coming, uh, if it kind of helps to alleviate the concerns of in some parts of population as you have now in the uh, in the sociological data, uh, well, you you ended the labor shortages, but. I think they will deal with it. I mean, you can always uh, select some uh, migrants from the neighboring countries. It kind of sounds like a silver bullet, you know. Uh, finally, they come, came up with a, with, a, with a perfect idea of how to reorganize the country. Doesn't that sound strange to you? Or maybe it's, this, is a, this is exactly, you know, this counter hegemonic project that you, you've been hinting at. Uh, like Putin finally delivered a, a, an alternative to neoliberalism. I mean, what, what do you make? No, I just, to, to me, it sounds almost, you know, almost theological. Mm, no, I, I, th I think I understand your question. And we actually had a, a similar discussion um, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. when we presented this paper for different conference. Uh, and there was a question about uh, maybe Putin is simply improvising, or not even Putin, but the people who are in charge for the finances and economy, they are improvising. And he had the brilliant answer. Yes, they may be improvising, but what's wrong with improvising? And what's also important is that they improvising along the Keynesian lines. 
and it's uh, not, they're not improvising in, 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 in along the neoliberal lines. What, for example, Zelensky government is doing in Ukraine, they're improvising along the neoliberal lines, and uh, there's also a class explanation behind that why they do this, and uh, uh, and the Russian government is doing a different thing. I mean, uh, I think the. Uh, the question about how how strategic it is is important, and we also uh, are noting that, uh, for example, even for the next year, uh, the Russian military uh, minister of finance is going is planning to reduce the budget deficit, so it starts to look less at least in their plans a little bit less attention economy, but they are more like getting back to what they are they been used to with strict strict fiscal. Uh, a discipline and, and and the thing that they are, they are allowing to do uh, more, but uh, I think it's also the, um, uh, the 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 guys had some objective challenges that Russia is facing now, and this is a, a kind of like solutions that may they may uh, come to in the process of uh, meeting those challenges. The and they and they, 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 that that may be a short term, but this short term solutions may create uh, some legacy, some reality that would uh, require to search for other solutions and so on. So, uh, I mean, it's uh, well uh, to sum up. I think I think it's a valid question to ask whether there is any ideology strategy behind that, and it might have some important consequences. But it's also there are some objective outcomes of this kind of policy, creating the groups of beneficiaries and also creating some groups who are starting to lose more from the inflation rather than uh, benefiting from the mili uh, expanded military production. And, and we need to, to, to analyze this new reality right? and to, to, to try to understand how sustainable it is. There are uh, other issues behind the labor shortage, it's also technology gap. For example, which is also important, the incapacity to uh, borrow on the many of the international markets, so on and so forth. So, uh, but th this is kind of like a new reality that that, that is trying, uh, that is starting to emerge, and it may emerge despite whatever is in the heads of Putin and other people who are in charge of the Russian economy. So I would add uh, quickly that uh, it is sort of improvisation. But some of the elements of what's happening uh, began earlier. So I've been reading Ministry of Finance documents for the last several years. And already during COVID, apparently they articulated a sort of protocation vision that we need to stimulate the economy and have this expansionary fiscal policy. And this will create jobs. This will increase incomes. So this explicitly Keynesian thinking, thinking already happened before the war. So they could build on this. And so it's not just some random movement towards you know, the silver bullet direction. So that's the first thing. And second thing, just the sheer scale of the change. So apparently, uh, transfers to the soldiers and their families alone uh, they amount to several trillion rubles each year. This is just a gigantic sum for the Russian budget. It's comparable to all the social spending on all other benefits except pensions. It's that just in numerical terms, it's a huge, huge change. And this is why uh, I think that it's legitimate to, to see this as not just some random thing that will end you know, rather quickly, but really as some kind of sea change because they were never, never that generous with the population before. You know, so the war changed that, and now they're really, really generous with with the soldiers. So they were generous with, uh, well, with the mothers and with families because of maternity capital. But it was still on a smaller scale that then this transfers to soldiers and their families, and so this would really change the social outlook in Russia. And uh, I've been studying social policy for for a few years, and. Uh, I can say that this is something new. This is not the things that were done before. This is the new level of spending, new level of commitment. And this is why we have the suspicion that this could be a kind of new you know, political economic order in Russia and not just uh, one ad hoc move. Okay, well, thank you very much.
Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming and for this wonderful conversation.